On the outside, they were loving mothers. On the inside, desperate addicts. I would get the kids in the car go to a drug dealer's house. Stacy's addiction was destroying her family. To pay her bills, Pasha became addicted to a life of prostitution. You can't ask yourself if you're going to be raped. You have to ask yourself how often. Sam knows his wife is addicted to shopping. He's about to find out just how big the problem really is. I'm beyond words right now. The secret addictions of suburban moms. That's what's coming up right now on Montel. Thank you so much for joining us today. You know, today we're talking to mothers who say that they've been living secret lives in order to cope with the stress that they face every single day. And my first guest says she nearly ruined her life and her family's life because of one thing, and that was her secret addiction. Please welcome Stacy to the show. Welcome on. Thank you. And I say secret addiction. Let's start at the end and talk back for a second. For almost eight years, you hid something from your husband, from everybody, from my everybody. mother. A, a couple of close friends knew, um, but they didn't know the severity of it. And um, uh, you get very good at, at having a, a separate secret life. Um, you become a master manipulator and you can fool everybody. You partied a little bit before you got married, right? Sure. Typical. Sure. And, and when I say typical, they get, describe yourself. I dipped yourself. and dabbed. Um, you know, we um, would have big parties at the house. Mm -hmm. Some of my friends were partiers. Um, mm -hmm. I never thought I went overboard. And partying meaning using some couple drugs. Couple pills Fuck here okay. and there. If somebody and had them. I wouldn't go looking for them. Somebody but, offered. I wouldn't turn it down. But if it was, let's say it was a Friday night, and I know I was going out with Stacy and, and her friends, Stacy's at, at two o'clock in the morning. Stacy's gonna be hanging it. in there with the rest of them and uh, yeah, trashed. Yeah, yeah. My appetite was large for alcohol mm. and, and drugs. Okay, so then you get married. I get married. Everything's for perfect. At Everything's first. good. I get pregnant. Partying a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Like, like married good couples. Good time. Just having a good time. Okay. Entertaining friends and family. And that, and right at this point in time, at the beginning of marriage, the drug of choice was what? Uh, alcohol and prescription pain medicine. And what kind of prescription pain medicine in particular? Well, it started with Vicodin, mm -hmm. Percocet. Mm -hmm. um, and at, when that couldn't sustain me, um, then it went on to Oxycontin, which is the real bad one. Which is the bad one. I'm going to stop for a second because, you know, Stacy's sitting here admitting to something that is really one of the fastest growing scourges in the country today. The number of wives, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers that are digging and dabbling in people's medicine cabinets uh. all over the country. Your friend comes over and goes in your bathroom. You better check your pills before you walk out if, in fact, you might happen to have some because what could happen, Stace? I have gone into so many people's medicine cabinets and stolen their pain pills. Looking for them. You know exactly what color they are, what's that, little numbers on the sides. Absolutely. And I could take them and put them back in a blink of an eye and you wouldn't know the difference. I've gone into people's purses. I've stolen, um, my father was dying at the time wait a minute, stolen his wait, pain stop, pills. Hold on. This is Stacy, middle class, upper middle class, wife. Baby. Mother of two. Did you even stop, you stopped using when, when I you was, got pregnant. When I got pregnant First with Haley. Pregnancy. I quit. Okay. Um, I treated my body like a temple. Mm -hmm. I um, was so infatuated and, and all wrapped up into the pregnancy, and I felt really good about myself. And the, and the little whisper in the back of your head that says, you know, you might have a problem here, um, backed off because I thought, see, I don't have a problem. Now, again, before the first pregnancy, had you taken Oxycontin in, or you were still Percocet? I hadn't gotten that far. It was Percocet that, right? Maybe one or two. One or two a day. That would do it. No, not even. Just maybe on a weekend or once a month, somebody would offer me a couple of pills. Sure, I'll take them. <laughs> Drink a few beers. Feel good for a couple two of days. Two would be enough. Never thought about more than that. For Haley's born, first baby's born. First then, baby's born. And then? And then I have to have some dental surgery. Mm -hmm. And she's about five months old. And um, I had started drinking a little bit of wine here and there, like the fuzzy, warm feeling that I'd get, but I mm -hmm. wasn't overdoing it. I was a mother now. Okay. I was a respectable person. Middle class. What's your husband do for a living? He's a sales manager for a car dealership. He said, making nice money. Nice money. You're paying all I'm the bills. I'm a professional. 
and you're paying all the bills, right? I'm helping spending all the money to, to uh, have to pay but, for the bills. But you kind of, that was your role as the wife of the family. Absolutely. The, all, you took care of the bookkeeping. So when... I kept everything in order. So Scott would ask, oh, that's being paid. Don't worry about that. Baby, I got it under got the taken care of, yeah. But, you know, 500 to the, to the heat and, and gas and electric. Cash in and, the pocket for some pills. pills. I started needing them, needing them, needing them. Talk, I want to, let's start from after your ba Haley is born. I go to the First, dentist. Go to the dentist. And then they they prescribe what for you? They prescribe extra strength Vicodin for me. Okay. Now, normal one, two, every, every three, five, four six hours. Every five, six hours. That's what I said. Every five, six hours. They were extra strength. Extra strength. Yeah, probably six hours. That's right. Be careful because they can be addictive. The doctor told you that. Absolutely. No, How actually, the doctor didn't tell me that, but if you don't live under a rock, you know that you shouldn't take more than prescribed. How many are we taking? Well, in the beginning, it was just as prescribed, uh -huh. but I found that it would take away the aches and pains of my jaw surgery, but it was taking away the aches and pains of the stress in my life. And it was giving me an energy that all mothers want when they have young children, that I could clean my house, and get the kids dressed and ready, and go next door and clean their house for that matter. I could take care of everything, Perfect be on top little of everything. Perfect little desperate housewife. And it was the energy, this pill gives you the energy that is, you're addicted to the energy at first. But talk, wait, all that energy you're getting, how were you as a mother? Perfect. Were you a mother then? Perfect. You think, were you paying attention to your baby? At that point. At that point. I was, yes. It was good. This pill became, became my best friend because it was making me the perfect everything. I was on top of my game. Two, three, four, every six hours get up to? How many did you get up to, the Vicodin? Well, I found that when the prescription ran out and I needed more, I'd call and get more. It's actually pretty easy if you're a little, oh, you know, nice you say the right things, wife. I get another prescription. Uh -huh. When the prescription ran out, I was becoming really crabby and moody. What's wrong with me? So I need another pill. Kids, be quiet. I gotta call the doctor. I need another pill. I need another pill. How many, 10, 15 a day? It got up to 20 to 25 a day when it got bad. My stomach was... You know, Brett Favre, Favre. I, I don't know how many people are gonna take a break, but let's, let's, let's put this in perspective. People remember years ago, Brett Favre came forward with his own addiction to Vicodin and pain pills. And at one point in time, at 22, 23 a day, mm -hmm. he was starting to have uncontrollable seizures. It can happen. Well, I'm gonna take a break because you went from the Vicodin to Percocet. The Oxycontin. The Oxycontin. I'm going to take a break. When we come back, we'll find out how Stacy hit rock bottom and how she actually came clean to her husband. Take a break. We'll be back right after this. I have to go out on a drug run and get some pills because, uh, either that, or I have to go to rehab because I want to die. I can't take it anymore. It's almost to the point where uh, I'm going to have to bail. I can't, it, it hurts me to think that I'm not going to be able to wake up and see my kids' faces in the morning. But at the same time, I'm not going to let her put us in a poorhouse either. Secret Lives. And again, welcome, Stacy, to the show. And I, and I, I gotta say to you, thank you again for coming out because there's so many women that are sitting home right now looking at this television show and they know exactly who they are. They're opening up their bottle right now while you're yeah, talking, right. popping a pill and going, oh, you know, you just couldn't handle it. Right. But how many, it just, mm, how could you answer this without, I don't want any of your friends to think you're talking about them, but you know how pervasive this is. Sure. What do you think? I mean, of housewives and, and mothers that are playing the game that you were playing, uh, there's no percentage, but was there a large number? Were there other people that you could commiserate with because you knew they had the same problem? Oh, yes. People stealing from you as much as you were stealing from them? No, it, it's that, that maybe they had a, an addiction of their own, mm -hmm. and um, I had a couple of friends who supplied me with pain pills for a long time. They were controlling my addiction, um, thinking they were keeping me safe from going out on the streets to get... And as my addiction grew, um, my girlfriend I knew always knew how to supply at home for whatever reason, and she'd say, "Okay, come over. I'll give you a couple. Mm. We'll drink some glasses of wine." And because she was addicted to the wine, right. and we could uh, make it okay. How much at the, at at the at your worst? How much were you spending, taking from your family, if you will, 
and putting in your mouth? I'd say about $1,000 a month on pills. Every month. And, 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 and what I was getting for free, the, the, the friends and the drug dealers couldn't keep up with my habit. So they started charging me, you know, more and more because, you know, supply and demand. So, and then at that point, I would pay anything. I would get the kids in the car if they were in their pajamas and say, come on, you know, drug dealer called, got to make my move. Come on, get your, get your slippers on. Mommy's going to take you to McDonald's. And I would go to a drug dealer's house, which I never thought that I would ever end up at in my wildest dreams. And uh, what are you doing, Mommy? Uh, mommy will be right back down, leave them in the car, go up and do my exchange. Oh, m Mommy had to take look, some look, money. These two, right here. Yeah. My babies. You get I, at that point, you don't think you're doing anything. You're justifying it in your head. Oh, it's just this once. Mm -hmm. I'll just do it this once. I'll just go get them and pay for it this once because, you know, I'm having a bad day because I have cramps, because it's raining, because it's sunny. Uh, the kids are getting on my nerves. I'm just I woke gonna, up. Yeah. It becomes any excuse. It takes over. It takes over. You, one night, your husband was walking up the steps, right? Right. And before you even saw him, you blurted out and said what? I said, you either have to go get me a six pack or I have to go out on a drug run and get some pills because, uh, you know, or I have to go to rehab because I want to die. I can't take it anymore. Please welcome Stacey's husband, Scott, to the show. Thank you. Mark goes out to you, man. I mean, you, when those, you heard those words walking up the steps. I did. Go right back there right now. What, how did that hit you in your face? Well, it, it, the, I think the alcohol was a cover for, uh, for, the drug, for the drug addictions. I was kind of blown away by the fact that she was telling me that she was addicted to drugs. Kind of knew that there was a little bit, the drinking was a, an issue, but I didn't, I was blown away that it had come to that, to a, you know, a drug addiction. You went to rehab the next day, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. The next day. The next day, thank God. And you decided to hang in there. Oh, wait, let's stop for a second. Looking back at that moment, I, I would think that what would, have, would have reverberated in me was, first off, have I been married to somebody I don't even know for 10 years? You hid this that well? And then it was, where have you been getting the money? Who's been giving them to you? Who's involved? He was felt betrayed at that point. Like he, he was the last to know, you know, at that point. It, right? Not I was absolutely felt betray betrayed. Hindsight is twenty twenty. obviously. I mean, I found out a lot of things crystallized for me after, you yeah, know, a lot of... Yeah, I mean, I, I was very involved with, with my job and trying to, you know, to, to make ends meet. And Stacy was very good at keeping things together. And, uh, but, you know, towards the end, things obviously started to unravel. Her mood swings were were violent. A, a lot of times I used to, when you didn't have drugs, you stayed in bed for a day, day and a half, sweating profusely, and she would tell you what? She was, she was had sick. The flu. Had the flu. She had the flu, and, and I, I, I kind of feel very naive, I mean, ignorant it, to a certain, you know, point, because I, um, I feel like I should have known. She was very good at it. She was very good at covering up, and a lot of the times I, I did make excuses that uh, it's her diabetes it's she's had too much to drink uh, you know i wanted things obviously you want to keep your family together and you don't want things to be out of control and uh, but you're keeping your family together now having found this out how by staying clean and sober and talk about that that's been obviously you uh, went to rehab for how long 30 days uh -huh. um i went the next morning went to a wonderful place in utah um scott of course was very supportive and mommy's going to get better. You know, you have to explain this to your four and six year old at the time. I'm leaving you for 30 days. There's so much shame in that. Well, why mommy? Um, you know, at the time I told them it was because I was a diabetic and I was gonna go learn how to eat better because they don't need to know the, the, the details of anything at that age. And I wanted to protect them. Um, and Scott's like, mommy's gonna go, come home, she's gonna be all better. And of course, that's what you're hoping for. Um, then there's also a fear, well, what if I don't like her when she's clean and sober? You know, I'm the fun, you know, and uh, what if I don't like her? What if I don't like him? Mm -hmm. What if I come back to this relationship and say, you know, That's this, what? I, you know, yeah, I, I, I got to do this on my own, you know? How long have you been clean now? 21 months. 21 months. Thank you.
to take a break because you have some other wives that are here, some other ladies that are here that are talking about hiding their secrets. It's so pervasive. There's no place that a woman in your position can look to feel shame. Uh, I say it this way. If all of your friends are doing it, the woman across the street, the chick, the woman in the office with you, everybody's doing it. How ashamed can you be? But somebody's got to wake up because this is starting to not just kill individuals, this is destroying families. Well, I would say well, doctors like to hand mothers that are stressed out anti-anxiety and pain medicine like, like they're candy. And they're highly addictive. So even you don't plan on becoming a drug addict. But th these things end up feeling for you, thinking for you, everything. And it, that's it. Then you become what you become. Yes, sir. I, I do, you know, I think that people um, are generally good. And, and if you take everyone in this audience out here in some part of their family, there's, if a you, there's someone there that's, that has a problem, we all can look at it. Whether it be an aunt, uncle, Don't sister, brother. Don't be afraid to be judged. And generally, people are good. They're, they want when you when Stacy came out and said that she needed help and started getting help. People, I was welcomed with open arms. People, people really said, it. you know what? We're proud of you, Stacy. People were glad for us. And and I, it was kind of tough at first having to go to work. Well, where's your wife? She's in. Well, she's in rehab. She's, but. Generally, people were like, that's great that she's They were wonderful. Out. They were Stacey wonderful. Stacey can do it. You can do it, too. I got to take a break. I'll come back. I mean, a mother whose addiction was money, but the only way she could get that addiction fulfilled was through prostitution. I'll take a break. We'll be back right after this. Every time you go out to an appointment, you're risking being sexually assaulted. You're risking all these other things. When, when I would hire someone and they'd ask about sexual assault, I'd say, you can't ask yourself if you're going to be raped. You have to ask yourself how often you're going to let it happen. My husband has no idea the extent of my addiction. My addiction is shopping. I'm always in the stores. I am always buying things that we don't need. Our savings account, my husband thinks that there's over $2,000, but there's under 500 in it. I'm hiding. guest says that she became a prostitute and a madam in order to support her family. Please welcome Pasha to the show. And, and again, it's, it's almost like Stacy. And, and I say thank you for you coming here on the show and coming out, if you will, of, of the darkness mm -hmm. and talking about what's going on in a lot of households. In your case, though, you got a prognosis for or a diagnosis for your son, did you not? Yes. I was working as a domestic violence counselor and trying to make ends meet as a single mother without any support from anyone. And uh, my son was diagnosed with a mental illness when he was very young and facing steep medical bills and uh, and other uh, um, issues. I mean, not just, yeah, just basic housing and putting food on the table. Uh, being a domestic violence counselor, unfortunately, doesn't pay very much. And sure. so a girlfriend of mine said, well, you know, we, we get these calls. Would you like to go out and, and uh, work? And Reluctantly, I agreed to because I had to pay an electricity bill and, and some other things that were going on. And but let's talk a little bit about this because this is the reason why so many other women are getting caught up in right. this. That first night, gig, whatever, yeah. that first day, gig, gig <laughs> job, the first. Right. You walk away with how much money in your pocket? Uh, that night I worked three hours and after fees out to the house I had $700 cash, which is almost what I made two we in two weeks working. Uh, in shelter and very quickly that went from seven hundred dollars in one night to Six to eight grand a month. Oh, yes. Yes quickly when I yeah I, I bought the escort service from my friend because she became addicted. Well, you start out on one night and next week you buy right. the escort service <laughs> um, It took it took a little time, but mm -hmm. but yeah, it was it was it was a progression that went a lot quicker than people would realize So, so. you're working and then you become you you yeah. became the pimp? I'm sorry, I like to call madam. You became the madam? <laughs> yes, I did. It's not anything I'm proud of. It's it's uh, something that I have guilt issues over and have to deal with every day that I would justify my actions by saying, well, I don't take as much money from the girls as other escort services do. They don't have to deal with a male pimp uh, and have to deal, give them favors or whatever it is that they have did to do. You, were you still working at this point in time for the, the social services? No, no. I had... I had stopped, uh, that stopped that completely. It was, 
part of the reason I, I started working as a prostitute was because they were going to hospitalize my son and uh, they had talked about hospitalizing my son and so I uh, um, working as a prostitute allowed me to work three or four hours a night and still provide care for him so this all <laughs> Would you have just continued doing this had you not gotten that knock on the door? I might have. Uh, it's a very complex issue. It, it's it, you feel very empowered. You're you're providing for your family, and yet. Wait, how long? How long of a period of time did you do this straight? Uh, about almost nine years. Well, seven and a half years, and then we got shut down. And, well, 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 but before so, the shutdown, so so seven and a half years straight mm -hmm. during this period. I mean, how were you? How were you hiding the money? Did you say you had a different business? You... I, I had several different fronts for different businesses. Would all your family members and friends, oh, everybody around you, what no did they think? They had no idea. They had no clue. Uh, they they thought I was working uh, testing software at home for a computer company. That's an interesting way to put it. <laughs> I got to take a little break. We'll be back right after this. I was devastated when he was very young and first started learning how to answer the phone. And most kids answer the phone and say, hello, or, you know, hi, Grandma, or whatever. And the first time he answered the phone on his own, he said, service may help you. You know, we've been talking to women who have been leading, if you will, double lives and hiding a lot of what they truly do from their family. Pasha, let's go back to, to that. That first night that you had to do this, what did you say to your son? Your son was 10. So that, this isn't like having a little baby at home. He's got to be starting to wonder, where's mom going? Actually, at the time, he was much younger. But okay. as I started, as he was getting older, he started to really pick up cues and try and figure out what was going on. Every time the phone rang, I would leave the room. I was devastated when he was very young and first started learning how to answer the phone. And most kids answer the phone and say, hello, or, you know, hi, grandma, or whatever. And the first time he answered the phone on his own, he said, service may help you. And that just crushed Because he heard you say service. That's what he heard me say. Every time I would answer the phone, I'd say, service may help you. And then I'd leave the room. Leave the room? Where would you have to bit, go then? I would just go to my bedroom and shut the door and, and, and set up an appointment with my son in the living room playing games or... So... Did you never ever worry about him seeing one of the people, one of your, your clients that went through? Or No. At, by, as he got older, I wound up running the escort service more than going out myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I did go out myself uh, whenever someone would request my presence. Uh, but for the most part, I was booking appointments for other people. He would see, um, the most he was exposed was he would see me walk out the door and, and out to the street to collect money from people. You know, I, I don't want to have, have anybody who's watching the show walk away from this thing. Well, you know, right. it's, it's a positive alternative. She was making no, a grand of. Absolutely well, not. There had this, that's the upside, if you will. You got right. to pay your bills. You took care of your medical bills for your son. But what was the downside just living through this? It was devastating. It was incredibly lonely. Mm -hmm. Those few friends, very few, that knew exactly what I was doing, they thought it was this glamorous lifestyle that, mm -hmm. that you know, I was out having fun. And they didn't realize that every time you go out to an appointment, you're risking being sexually assaulted. You're risking all these other things. When, when I would hire someone and they'd ask about sexual assault, I'd say, you can't ask yourself if you're going to be raped. You have to ask yourself how often you're going to let it happen. Were you assaulted? Oh, yes. There was... How many times? Oh, do you think? I couldn't even tell you. Count dozens, probably. Mm -hmm. But sexual assault is such a confusing issue in that situation. You're getting paid. You drive yourself there. Mm -hmm. You know, at one point in time, does it... Do you, do you say this is assault or not? Um, oftentimes, you just do things to get out of a situation safely, things you would never normally do. This all came crashing to a halt. How? Um, I got the knock at the door, and it was a detective from our county sheriff's department, and uh, he was actually a very decent individual, and, and sat me down and said, you need to shut it down, we know who you are, we know what's going on, and so, um, in tears, and with a modicum of relief, I uh, shut down my phone lines, and I was very, very, very lucky that they did not prosecute. But you shut down your phone lines, but wound up 
a cover story in the local newspaper, correct? Yes. Did they actually say we shut down a prostitution ring? Oh, no, no. What they, they never. Say? They never, um, that aspect never hit the media. Mm -hmm. There was a local situation where mm -hmm. uh, there was a scandal with the university, and I came forward in an attempt to be supportive of some alleged rape victims, <laughs> and instead it backfired. Instead of being a whistleblower and actually helping out people, um, they found a lovely old mugshot from a traffic incident mm -hmm. uh, when I was very young, and uh, it was on the cover of every newspaper. My employer found out I was out of the business, I was trying to start a new life, and uh, needless to say, I was fired. I lost my apartment, I lost my vehicle, I lost everything. Exactly what you tried to utilize the game to get out of, you exactly. wound up right back in the same Worse. spot. Worse, we wound up in a home with uh, no stove, no refrigerator, um, on the edge of homelessness. So I wound up going back to work, calling old clients and scheduling appointments um, so that we wouldn't be on the street. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was for another, what, year, year and a half? Uh, yeah, about a year. Uh, and it wasn't setting up appointments for other people by that point in time. It was just me going out and working and um, leading this double life in the sense that here I was being contacted by attorneys to help out with this court case and so on and so forth and putting on this brave front for everyone look at me I'm I'm out of the game and when in actuality I would You're turn around out. and have to sneak around and work what, so. so what made you stop completely I um, had been working so much I rarely checked my mailbox because I was so exhausted and so depressed and just so devastated emotionally and trying to put on a brave face for my son and not let him know that anything was wrong I hadn't checked the mail and my son called me from school and he said mom did you know about this award I was getting today I had no clue um, he had an invitation to be a part of an award ceremony and uh, ever all the other parents were there dressed up and they had a brunch and that was the the straw that broke the camel's back I just sobbed so hard I just broke down I I was crying so hard I threw up I was laying on the bathroom floor in my you started this because you wanted to do this for your son yes you started this because you wanted to get you and your son out of the situation right. you were in right you wind up in a worse situation yes and then not even paying attention to your son right I right, gonna take a little break we come back two different types of addiction I'll give you one more a lot of women suffer from this and it's very it's crazy not just a shopping addiction but actually you get the same rush out of drug that you would get from drugs from walking in the store and putting yourself in so much debt that your entire family may be in jeopardy of losing everything it has we take a break we'll be back right after this say that they had to file bankruptcy because of her secret shopping addiction. Take a look at this. Me and my husband Sam have been married for five and a half years. We have a 21 month year old son and we have a one month old daughter. My daily stresses and struggles as a mom are waking up with the kids in the middle of the night and trying to get both of the kids fed, bathed, um, the house clean, grocery shopping, play dates, just everything, laundry done. My wife is so stressed out because she has to be cooped up in a house with two kids all day. The little one cries constantly when she's awake, when she's hungry. Well, the stress that Jolene goes through as a mom, I could understand and I can kind of, you know, feel for her. I mean, I wish I could do more for her. She's got to change, feed the kids. She's got to keep the house. I kind of expect dinner on the table when I come home. I love her and I love my kids, but it's hard right now. Sam! Please welcome Jolene and Sam to the show. Where, where did this come from? How did this all start? I, it all started when I became a do-it-all mom. Mm -hmm. When I started um, doing all my running around with the kids and just never having time for myself, I guess. But a lot of people are do-it-all moms running around with the kids, don't have time for themselves, but then don't go out and put the family in bankruptcy. I know, it's just, I guess it was something that made me feel good. I was always doing for, you know, my kids. See, and I don't, other nobody people. understands what it is we're talking about here. You truly are addicted to shopping. I am. And, and just so we can get it, look, Sam's sitting there like, hey, you ain't getting 
That's right. But but let, let's let's explain. You go out anything that says sale, mm -hmm. even if you don't want it. it exactly. You buy it. Mm -hmm. Is she even close to aware of how much debt you're in? Um, no, not really. I do everything. I do everything. You do all the bills. I do all the bills. You know, don't I have a piece of tape that I wanted to take? Where's that tape at? Take a look at this. My husband has no idea the extent of my addiction. My addiction is shopping. I'm always in the stores. I am always buying things that we don't need. I get my money to shop by him not knowing how much we have after bills or even before bills. And I also get unemployment checks. When I come back from the stores, I conceal some of my um, items that I buy by either keeping them in the bags and shoving them in cupboards, my, leaving them in the car until I can bring them up. My hiding spots are in the closet. I have two punch bowl sets. I have two poker sets. I have a popcorn gift set. I don't even really know what that is. And here I have a whole tote of clothes, shoes, stuffed animals. I have bath sets. I bought 41 of these tarps. I have two crock pots hidden up here. I have a box back there, hidden back there, that's filled with cups, the change jar. It was about halfway filled when I cashed it in, and now there's barely anything left. I have a turtle sandbox, a bike helmet for my daughter whenever she can use it. I bought my son's next year Halloween costume and my daughter's next year winter jacket. We're living check to check. We just get the bills paid and the second that we got money set aside, some way or another it disappears. I'm spending easily two, three hundred dollars a week on items that we don't need. I had to take her bank card from her. I keep it locked up in a safe. My husband thought that he was taking away our bank card and he put it in our safe where he thought that I couldn't get to it, but I just reordered another one. Our savings account, my husband thinks that there's over $2,000, but there's under 500 in it. I'm the only one really keeping this family together money-wise because her unemployment checks, I don't know where to go. I actually pawned off my wedding ring. I pawned his bracelet that he's still looking for. I try to save up money. I want to own a house someday. I want my kids to live in a house. I don't want to pay rent when I could be paying a mortgage. This has affected my marriage because I'm lying to my husband. I'm hiding a lot from him that he needs to find out about. Sam, about five bombs just then, are they not? Did you know she pawned off your wedding ring? No, I didn't know that one. Did she, what was the other ones that you just gave up right there? He doesn't know how much is in our checking account. He's, he's, we're trying to save for a house and, and um, he's been asking me if I deposit the money and I haven't been depositing the money. How much did you think was in that account? Over 2,000? No, oh, about 1,800 I thought. And how much is really in that account? Can you tell him the truth today? There's under 500. And what else? Today is the day you got to come completely clean. Yeah, I changed in that change jar that we've been saving. And I, I, know, I knew that happened, but I knew the change wasn't in there. Did you also know that you, you locked up her, her bank card, correct? Yeah, I didn't know she ordered another one. Um, he took it away from me after Christmas, and I reordered it right away. So since then, for the last three months, She's been using that car. I'm sorry. Let me sorry. take a little break. Take a little break and come back. Maybe we'll have somebody to help us out. Figure a way to see if you can bring this to an end. Take a break. We'll be back right after this. Sam, I'm sitting there watching you just think this through. You've been trying your best to keep this family solvent, have you not? Yes, I have, man, so, and it's almost to the point where I, I, I'm going to have to bail. I can't, I, it, it hurts me to think that I'm not going to be able to wake up and see my kids' faces in the morning, but at the same time, I'm not going to let her put us in a poorhouse either. I can't, I can't, it's, I'm behind words right now. There may be more options than saying just bail. You've hung in there. How long has the two been together? Five and a half years now. Married. And, well, married five and a half years. We've been together. Probably about eight. Please welcome addiction specialist, Mr. Terry Shulman, to the show from the Shulman Center.
Terry. And, and, I mean, we've talked about three different forms of addiction on the show. Right. And, and, but this is one, again, most people are looking at this and like what well, I do, initially make light of this. But this isn't a light issue. This is affecting a family in a, to a point that this may not be a family. What right. can they do? I, and I think Sam needs to know that this isn't the end of the road. Right. Well, um, money problems is replacing sexual and romantic difficulties as the number one issue for divorces, if it hasn't already done so. So you're not alone. That's across the board, across the board. Across country. the board. We've got a betrayal here. There's been a betrayal of trust. I know I need to stop. It's just, it's just hard once you get in there, you know, you right. go for eggs or something, you've got to run to the store next door. Yeah. What does this feel like to you, Jolene? What's been happening? What does this feel like for you? Well, when I find something that I like, it gives me a rush, but then when I get home, I feel really guilty and I feel, you know, right. that I should be doing it. That is the cycle that we've heard about all day. The secrecy, the shame, it's taking a toll financially and emotionally on your marriage. If given the right treatment and in the right counseling, this can be something that can be settled, correct? Oh, absolutely. Um, the problem is we're just waking up to shopping or spending addictions as legitimate. And there are very few groups, very few books, and very few specialists. I've worked with many. One of the things I think we ought to, ought to try to address is there are maybe not as many organizations out there, but she can go to any other form of addiction recovery treatment center, 12-step, 10-step program, yes. and achieve some of the same results, correct? Correct. And there is a website, shopaholicsanonymous.org, that you might go to. Take a break. We'll be back right after this. Any form of counseling whatsoever over this? No, yeah. No. Why not? Probably time. Time, yeah. Um, and he didn't really know how bad it was. But now he knows. And I mean, I think if you understand and listen to what your husband just said to you, this is this is it. He gave you an ultimatum <laughs> three months ago. And Doc, this, like this is something, Terry, I don't know. <laughs> ultimatums don't work. I think we know that when it comes to addiction. Right. And taking away her charge card or her bank card will only invoke rebellion in her. It has to be your choice. And like you heard from our other two guests, if you want help, people will be there for you with open arms. Is it, is it too much free time on wives' hands? It isn't just wives. Husbands have plenty of addictions of their own, as you well know. I, I, I just, um, just but, thought I'd throw that out. But women in particular uh, may look to motherhood as being this incredibly beautiful spiritual experience that will fill them up with love. And that can be part of it, but it may not always live up to the high hopes and expectations. So there can be disappointment. It, it's actually the beginning of a new life, but it's the death of an old one, the death of you as a single person, uh, a married person, as a person who was working, but now is not. You talked also about how you miss contact with yeah. other adults. So what do you do? You go into a store, and at least there's adults. Yeah. And maybe you need another outlet. Maybe you need to find other people to help out at home. Maybe you and your husband can negotiate. I think you ought to be a little more involved in the finances to oversee that, have that be a joint venture. Maybe, Sam, even though you work hard all day, you can help out a little at home and give her... So you can work it out. You're lovely yes, people. I, I, I do that all the yeah. time. I come, I come home, I take my kids, I know she needs a break. Right. But first thing she does, I have to go get something else to make for dinner. And I'm calling her a half hour later, well, where are you at? Well, I had to stop at Target to right. get this, or I had to stop at Walmart to get that. Right. You know, and so she's just looking for an opportunity to get out of the house? Do. I do. Right. Take a break. We'll be back right after this. I'm out of time. I wish you guys luck. Sam, do not give up right now, because I don't think it's... Try. I, I know. You've tried not to at this point in time, but now I will tell you, the one thing that you guys have not done is really tried to fix the problem. Okay? You said fix it and expected it to be fixed. She doesn't know how to. So you guys have worked on so many other things together. Why not work at this together? Take advantage of this opportunity to get some really good therapy and some help. If that doesn't work out and not long enough, we'll get you some more. But don't quit that easy. But I would say just reach out and ask for help. Stop trying to do this on your own, because obviously you couldn't do it, right? Join us in the next month.